Hello everybody, it's time for our uh, first video we're going to be going over. White nationalist Thorne Chen's stupid video on trickle-down economics, and I have a few friends here say hello. What's poppin' Pogstoners? Yeah. What's good, Pogstoners? Yeah, Pogstoners, okay, up? yeah. We'll go with that. So we already watched a little bit of this video. Uh, we're skipping the intro because we watched it like maybe two times at this point. <laughs> Because I tried streaming it, and it failed, so let's get ready to go. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's the intro, her intro sucks anyways. It's yeah, just, her like, intro. rambling for three minutes about, like, how she's selling soap or something. Selling soap, help. Ooh, the leftists, the leftists want trickle-down, don't like trickle-down economics, they don't like lowering taxes for the rich, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's just begin with the video, because this intro's coming a little too long economics is what the left constantly accuses the right of pushing and trickle-down economics is the idea that the right just wants to give tax cuts and tax breaks to the rich and large corporations and they think that'll somehow help the lower and middle class even though it never actually does uh, that is a total lie. First off, the proper term for it is supply side economics. So if you're someone who wants to know more about this whole discussion, but you keep looking up trickle down economics and you're confused as to why everything seems to be negative against it, and maybe it is just some crazy right wing talking point, it doesn't actually work. No, the reason why you're getting biased results is because you're using a biased search term. So Let's pay really close attention to the fact that she is complaining for like a solid minute straight about the fact that people call it trickle-down economics. Like, she keep is, a close eye on that, because this is the setup to the world's greatest punchline. She is coping so hard over this. This is like- Supply economics, or maybe even Reaganomics, yeah, is what you should economics. look into if you want to know more about this topic. And just really quickly, according to Investopedia, supply-side economics is an economic theory that postulates tax- Trickle down to the overall economy. This always gets me whenever I watch this video. Trickle this down. is literally the punchline, yeah. Supply-side economics is an economic theory that postulates tax cuts for the wealthy result in an increased savings and investment capacity for them that trickle down to the overall economy. Trickle down economics, bro. This her is why we call it. Her own definition uses the term that she's whining about. I know. And then she goes on to use another definition, which basically like says three different things it does. We'll, we'll get to that point in a second cuts for result in increased savings and investment capacity for them that trickle down to the overall economy. That is a better definition than what we would likely hear from someone like Biden or AOC or Bernie Sanders, but I mean, that's what they call it. You know, I'm not sure if she's ever watched the Bernie Sanders or AOC or Biden speech, but that's pretty much what they call it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Let's go. Still, it has its own biases. And surprisingly, oh, I do? think that Wikipedia she spent so much of this video just crying and not make any count making any counter arguments against the left-wing position. It's like, been wasted four five minutes on this. Oh yeah, wait until you see her actual points. It is absolutely dog shit. Media explains it much better. As some random editor explains, supply-side economics is a macroeconomic theory that postulates economic growth can be most effectively fostered by lowering taxes, decreasing regulation, and allowing free trade. The reason people call it uh, call this trickle-down economics is because. Republicans focus on lowering taxes the most. They know people don't care about regulation or free trade. They care, they know people care about what's going to affect them the most, which is lowering taxes. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, nothing much else to say beyond that, I guess. So, according to supply side economics, consumers will benefit from greater supplies of goods and services at lower prices and employment will increase. Supply side economics is the type of mentality that the Trump administration had and that's why you saw them doing things like decreasing the number of federal regulations on small businesses or businesses of any side really as well. I want to I want to ask real quick, did they decrease any regulations on small businesses or what did they do about that exactly? Yeah, Paul, um, not, how do you... Not that, not that I know of, so, like, I, I know that, um, Trump did decrease, like, a lot of, um, business, or rather, um, corporate tax rates, which does, um, affect small businesses to a certain extent. Um, I, I find it pretty rich that she's trying to say that the Trump administration had this supply-side mentality, when even in the definition that she selected, uh, free trade is a critical pillar of supply-side economics, and Trump was 
immensely against free trade by levying huge tariffs against the European um, steel and commodities and uh, with goods and services uh, with China as well. So yeah. Trump by no means was a supply side um, theorist. And on the issue of lowering taxes, Trump did lower taxes um, primarily for the wealthy. And we saw this back in 2017, 2018 when um, corporations got like huge, huge windfalls in cash by repatriating a lot of their profits to the U.S. when we really, really cut the corporate income tax. And in doing so, we had like a $1 trillion worth of uh, stock buybacks uh, as a result of that. So uh, tax cuts can help stimulate the economy if they're targeted towards like lower income people. If you target it towards the wealthy and investors, like that's not – you're going to get very, very little growth. Yeah, because from uh, like the w- wealthy and stuff, they're not gonna put it back into like in making more jobs. They're just gonna freaking buy more stocks, give it to shareholders and stuff. You know, pretty stuff like that. Stuff that doesn't really help. Yeah, they're not gonna. Us. St- yeah, they're not gonna stimulate it by like buying goods and services, like which is what you do to stimulate an economy, because like wealthier people just tend not to spend um past a certain level of wealth and income. Like this is the thing about most conservative arguments in regards to economics they focus so much on this common sense type of logic like it sounds good on paper but in reality it doesn't translate well at all you know yeah i mean Mm -hmm. the worst part about this like line of uh, this line of like anti-redistributive um sort of policy um is 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 if we have like actual data on like the way people perceive their quality of life at different income brackets and what you see is like a really really fast um uh, sort of like uh, uh, diminishing returns aspect to this. You don't it's like it's not it's not it's not a matter of like you gain more wealth and you're like your your quality of life skyrockets. Like at some point it like flatlines to the point where you're like it's it's there you're you're not really able to perceive the uh, the advantages you now gain within your wealth, especially with yeah, like because rising cost of living. Yeah, the amount of you. Yeah. yeah, the amount. It's like marginal utility. Like for every mm-hmm. additional dollar that you earn past a certain income bracket or past a certain limit you're just not going to get the same amount of utility like a millionaire would by earning an extra dollar than like somebody earning $60,000 would get by earning their their money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, continue. Well, as lower tax rates for individuals and for corporations. And if you're still wondering why on earth lowering taxes for big businesses and wealthy people would somehow make the middle class wealthier, it's a pretty simple concept, actually. Supply side economics. I want to add one thing. No, um, I want you to keep in mind how she calls this a simple theory and I'll bring it back up later in the video. Economics theorizes that if people have more money in their pockets, not just the wealthy, but people in general, and if there are fewer barriers to starting up your own business and operating that business, then people will be more likely to do things like pursue entrepreneurial endeavors. And if people... I want you to notice too, by the way, notice how she said it theorizes, not that it actually works. This doesn't work, you know? This is a freaking theory. And it's a crappy one because, like, empirical evidence show this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Yeah, the, if your theory has, like, no predictive power, it's the kind of theory that you just dump, right? And you move on to something else, which is how the scientific method works. But unfortunately, because of the fact that, like, in most of the prescriptions that somebody could make from economics would be really, really, really heavily politicized for obvious reasons, it, it means that those sort of, like, these things that are um, sort of, like, the status quo within the rest of the scientific world can sometimes be swept under the rug, and because of this, you see sort of things like praxeology become common, uh, not not m- not majority by any means, but common strains of thought within um, within economics, and it kind of, it kind of sucks. Yeah. So I think there would, it would there'd be a lot of merit to the field if it wasn't for the sake of like insane conservatives trying to like shoehorn their ideology into a field where it doesn't really belong. Their arguments basically rely on uh, preying on the ignorance of people, like people not knowing what this actually translate to knowing that this doesn't actually work it just relies on like it makes sense doesn't it that means it's true and they like they mask it by like like saying it's like very like gives you a lot of freedom and like those kind of people are really into like freedom so like they just like bite that bait yeah exactly okay let's go are more likely 
start businesses, that means they're more likely to hire people. And obviously by hiring people, these businesses are creating jobs, not just for other wealthy or upper middle class people, but also for lower and middle class people. So the idea is to foster an environment where the free market itself can generate jobs for people instead of having them rely on, for example, government benefits. And ironic- Wait, what? She's talking about like- why is it bad to like rely on government benefits? At least in this economy, people need to rely on government benefits because of how crappy this economy is, you know? Yeah. yeah Not just I... that, but we we should also take into account when, like, for for example, like if we were to put ourselves in the shoes of an entrepreneur, like if you were to start a business, like that requires an immense amount of risk. So. We've seen this um, actually in European countries that if you increase government benefits, specifically like unemployment insurance or um, some sort of like cash transfer, like a universal cash transfer that's guaranteed to you whether you're working or not, that this increases risk taking behavior. So people might go back to university, get better skills, or even start businesses because if you have the confidence that if you, you know, go on to like a really really lucrative business endeavor and it doesn't work out then you, you can rely on the government safety net to like bail you out whereas like in the absence of like robust government benefits if you take that risk like you're fucked and, yeah and it i know doesn't work out like th that's it but if you can rely on that safety net like that encourages yeah more like more risk taking which can like result in even stronger um entrepreneurship or economic much. growth like uh, she's suggesting the American economy doesn't allow risk taking. You can you can have like a lot of money, but if your business fails, yeah, you're pretty much fucked. And that's like the sad reality of the American economy. And these freaking conservatives keep trying to push like you should take risks and stuff. But if you take risks, you're you are fucked. Whereas in other developed countries, you're not. You know. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And, and like we we should further like demonstrate this hypocrisy with conservatives. So like yes, they will tell you to go out and take risks, but they won't like try and create like a better environment to encourage more risk taking if you they'll try and promote like family values for example but they won't uh, support like expansions of child tax credits or um you know family assistance or child care in order to help families like get started and live like a decent quality of life especially so, against the poor people just, they, yeah they discriminate so hard against like poor people and stuff with these kinds of things like especially poor people who mm. fail because they took those risks like uh i've seen people on the streets be like uh like um higher up wealthy people but because something went wrong in their life they're now on the streets and the conservatives are like oh you just failed you you don't deserve help because you're poor blah 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 you're not trying hard enough you know yeah exactly i mean when you when you center your economy about around like um like promotion of uh what is effectively like something near gambling for a lot of people um and then you don't have any sort of like social safety net for when these like the gambles fall through then it it, it it creates a really really like miserable um society for a lot of people yeah let's uh continue Ironically enough, supplied economics also relate to the demand side of the economy because if people of really all income brackets have more disposable income because they're paying less in things like taxes, that means they are going to have more money to spend on consumer goods, which then is going to stimulate these businesses, have make them have more. But the thing is, people do not have that money in America because of the high cost of living. You can have the lowest taxes you want, but if people are going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on like universal health on like a uh, private insurance and all these other things which shouldn't like cost money at the point of service that doesn't matter yeah like if you're paying for like bills and stuff at like a super high cost if you're paying for like medications that cost like hundreds of dollars without insurance lower taxes don't really matter it only saves you so much money yeah you should also um mention the fact that what what Lauren is trying to say here is like she's just reciting a Say's Law, which is like at its simplest, it's like a really, really old classical economics term. And it just basically says supply creates its own demand. So if you create stuff, that'll generate income for workers, and then workers will use that income to buy goods and services. But the problem with this is that people are not going to invest or produce stuff if there's a weak demand. So, for example, like in recent years in the U.S., we have had weak consumer demand uh, compared to, like, previous decades. 
So this like halts business growth because if you if you're a business person, let's say you have no risk uh, or very very little risk. If there's no demand for your product or you see like people have really low uh, disposable incomes, like you mentioned, uh, Hearthstone, or for a variety of other reasons, people just don't want to spend money practical being risk averse. You're not going to generate like profits or like excess returns from that. So your incentive to invest is going to be a lot weaker if you know people just aren't spending money. So like they act is to, yeah yeah they act under the assumption that pe- that we are allowed to take risks in this economy when we really aren't. That's basically what they're arguing. You're allowed to take risks in America and you'll probably succeed when that's not really the case. And if you don't succeed, yeah, like I said before, you're just screwed pretty much. Okay. What's this? More money and allow them to hire more people. And even though in 2021, we love to rag on the rich who are just sitting on all of their wealth, making it lay there in savings account, not doing anything for anyone. The truth is because we have a fractional reserve banking system, which is a phrase I've mentioned many times before, the fact that people do have savings in their bank accounts means that it's easier for people to get things like student loans or small business loans. That is so bullshit. You see the student loan debt like triple within like the last decade. And I actually have a source for this. The unemployment and low wages are up. People are having a really hard time saving money because of several things such as living paycheck to paycheck because of the high cost of living, having a low salary, too much debt, all these different things. And then I have another source which talks about how the average American savings account balance is 3500 bucks, and they usually have less than 5000 which is barely enough to even cover a hospital visit. Yeah. Ooh. So, firstly, um, I think what Lauren's trying to get here is that really rich people like Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, like these people hoard their money in savings accounts, and if you have your money in a savings account, then that's going to be uh, loaned out to you know small business people, regular everyday average Joes who are going to use it to buy goods and services and have those goods, but. Firstly, even if that were the case, you would still have to take assume that there's strong demand for credit, that there are small business owners that want to open businesses because they see that there's like strong demand, strong consumer demand for their products, or that there's strong consumer demand for like regular goods and services that people would take credit cards out or personal loans to buy, which in recent years, we have like pretty weak consumer demand. So even if there's like a huge supply of credit, if people don't want it, useless secondly people like jeff bezos or like the absolute uber wealthy they they don't keep their money in savings accounts they keep it typically in stocks um bonds and other uh, financial securities not like a checking account or savings account at a bank so like she is just hilariously misinformed um well not misinformed but like she's being very deceptive yeah i think it's just obviously if it's kept in like financial securities rather than like a bank then it's going to be like less uh, it's not going to be like as uh, uh, what, what would the word be like charitable to her side yeah this point is so fucking dishonest saying people have like I mean we're allowed to have money to save for student loans and stuff but the issue is we do not have the money to save for student loans the average American does not have enough money to even pay for college like it's in, it's just insane that she pushes this idea that everybody that a lot of even a a lot of people can do that, but that's just not true. A lot of people can't. But like your point earlier that student loan debt has like tripled or quadrupled or whatever like that, she would say like, yeah, and that's because like wealthy people, uh, like the top 1%, like, you know, making that wealth is what's funding all of those student loans that people are taking out. Like that, that, that would be her argument. Yeah. Let's uh, continue. So just in general, if you want to understand what supply side economics means, it's enabling people to create their own opportunities for wealth. And even though a lot of people doubt the efficacy of supply side economics, it does have a pretty great proven track record. And we need look no further than what was happening to the economy under the Trump administration. Under the Trump administration, black and Hispanic. That's false. That is completely false. I have a chart right here from the BLS showing that Ever since 2011, the black unemployment rate has slowly gone down, and it just it just reached historic lows under Trump, probably because of, uh, I think, Obama's policies. I don't know which one specifically, but it's been going down for over a decade. 
and she fails to take that into account because it's just so dishonest and it makes the right look good, you know? Not really much more to unemployment went to a record low, and not only that, but wages were also increasing. I have her article for that as well, by the way. I, you guys saw it earlier. Wait a minute. What? Yeah, I was about to say, did she, like, show that for, like, half a second? Like, yeah, minimum yeah. wage increases did fuel faster wage growth for those at the bottom, but that wasn't, like, at the federal level. That was, like, she showed, she showed US the, states. she showed, like, the first two sentences but I have her source on screen right now, and it talks about how um, the reason also grew is because, like, 20 different states raised their minimum wages. Like, Yeah, that's – this isn't attributable to Trump. It's different U.S. states increased their minimum wage. Yeah, and then I have a uh, – I have a chart right here on the thing talking about how the bottom 25 percent uh, get wages increased – even more in states that increased their wages, while uh, states that didn't increase their minimum wage barely saw an increase. And then the other 75% of the workforce saw little to no increase at all in both uh, states. Yeah. Mainly the yeah, bottom... And wait a minute. And, and wait a minute. Increasing the minimum wage is, like, it, that's not deregulation. It's making the bar to starting a business much higher. It, like, restricts... Or it creates like more restrictions towards starting a business because if your labor costs are higher, it's going to be harder to compete um, in the market. So I don't know why she's citing this as like a win for Trump or his quest side of it. It's funny Trump she's citing a source. Probably which, not support. It's funny she's citing a source which directly contradicts what she's saying. Like trickle down economics are responsible for this, but it's but her own source are, is saying that it's because states are raising their wages and stuff. You know. Yeah. Her own source contradicts her. Like, let's, let's get let her keep digging her hole. Yeah, let's do this. It is true that under supply side economics, big businesses and the wealthy tend to get things like tax breaks and fewer regulations on their wealth and their operations. But that doesn't inherently mean that the rest of the population is screwed over because economics, despite what progressives and the left might think, is not a zero sum game. It is possible for, and this is such a cliche, a rise. She says it's not a zero-sum game. She's basically saying it's not, like, that simple. But look at how many things she's trying to dumb down. She tries to dumb down the Laffer curve later on. She tries to dumb down trickle-down economics to such a simple theory, such like, oh, it's based on common sense kind of thing. She's, like, picking and choosing what is simple and what isn't for her stupid narrative that trickle-down economics are somehow good. <laughs> like, what a dumb broad tied to lift all boats. And what's really frustrating about that speech that Biden gave is that supply side economics is really all about the free market, lowering taxes, less government regulation. But did you notice there that he is trying to tie what happened during the pandemic where the government was telling business they could not operate? He is trying to associate that with supply side economics. What Wait, we saw the speech earlier. When did he ever say that trickle down economics was responsible for uh, for this, this whole situation? When did he say that? Oh boy. If, if, if he did say it during the speech, he didn't include it. So. I didn't. I He said that trickle-down economics were bad, but I don't, I'm don't. i not really sure he ever attributed it to this. I'm not sure if she's strawmanning him or not. I'll have to go back later just to make sure. But I don't know. It's kind of... I wouldn't be surprised if she's strawmanning him, though. You know? Yeah. Like, oh, it's good he calls that economics, even though... It's one of the furthest things from it. Under the COVID restrictions, governors, and in some cases, even the federal government in different countries were telling businesses like restaurant owners or even just small businesses that they could not operate. Meanwhile, because of, I would say, crony capitalism, places like Walmart and Amazon got exemptions. There is nothing about that that relates to supply side economics. This this is actually- I don't think anybody ever argued that that was part of supply side economics, though. I don't think anybody's ever said that. the result of big government policies like the type that Biden advocates for. So for him to be all on board with, yeah, let's do lockdowns. We need to do more to stop the virus from spreading one day and then turn around and say, see, look what capitalism did. It's like, 
This wasn't capitalism. This was directly you. And one of the biggest criticisms that supply side economics gets is that it introduces tax cuts usually, which some people claim actually lowers the amount of revenue that the federal government brings in. So I've heard a lot of people on the left saying, oh, well, you claim to be fiscally conservative, but you're really just putting the government into more debt. What's fiscally conservative about that? And actually, case in point, we have this article from CNNBC, which says that the U.S. lost more tax revenue than any other developed country in 2018 due to the Trump tax credits. Yeah, so this is very, very biased reporting, and it's frustrating because they're not technically lying, but it's the type of headline where unless someone actually knows something about economics and actually bothers to read the entire piece, they're going to be coming away with a complete who actually knows something about economics. Not she is dummy. She's like picking and choosing what is like simple and what isn't when everything is pretty relatively complex and needs a lot of uh, research to go behind it. And I want I want you to see the point she makes, which is so out like so stupid. You'll see in a second. Lead different and perception of what the reality of the economy actually is. You see, later on in the article, it clarifies that U.S. tax revenue as a proportion of GDP drops the most of any country in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2018. Yeah, so here they are measuring tax revenue that the government brings in as a percentage of GDP, which is really strange because if you've actually heard anything about the way federal budgets are written out, they don't operate as a percentage of GDP. They operate in just real numbers. This many hundred millions for this project, a billion here, a billion there, they don't work as a percentage of GDP. So writing this article claiming that the U.S. is lowering its tax revenue as a percentage of GDP is going to lead people to assume that, uh uh-oh, we're in a bigger deficit just because of these tax cuts, but that is not actually the case. The amount of revenue that the federal government got from individual income taxes in 2018 was actually higher than it was in- I want you to notice, she she talks about only individual income taxes. She doesn't talk about taxes as a whole. Why? Because we lost money overall. I even have an article over here talking about how they didn't pay for themselves. If you guys want to say something while I just scroll through it for the audience. So two quick things. It is perfectly normal and perfectly acceptable to talk about federal spending and just federal budgets overall as a percentage of GDP. If you, you can talk about the budget deficit, like that difference between uh, tax revenue and tax ex- or expenditure government spending, um, as a percentage of GDP, like you can express these things as a percentage of GDP, and these can be very valuable in explaining um, if your uh, if your economy is growing really quickly, but your tax base isn't growing growing as quickly, then that's not good. Especially if you want to use some of that huge economic growth to invest in things like infrastructure, research, and development, and education. Um, secondly, the t- Trump tax cuts absolutely increase the budget deficit um from the last i read it increased by around a trillion dollars one or two trillion dollars over 10 years so it absolutely increased the budget deficit in terms of percentage of gdp as well as in uh, absolute terms so she's just lying here she is literally just lying. she's moving the goalpost of the original argument which was the chat the original argument from conservatives was the Trump tax cuts would pay for themselves, but now she's moving the goalposts and saying, oh, actually people paid more income taxes, so that means it worked. And I want you to see here, even it shows that corporate income taxes were less, they paid less, and my source shows that uh, if we didn't have them, individual income taxes would be paid a little bit more. They would be getting a little bit more uh, money from income taxes without the... Uh, tax cuts and then i have this other chart up here showing that we would have gotten a lot more revenue without uh these tax cuts but instead we just plummeted by quite a bit it is so stupid this is so like bad faith you know like she's wheezed yeah let's go 2017 In 2019, the amount that the federal government got from individual income taxes increased a little bit further still. Regarding corporate income, there was a drop-off of about $100 billion. But again, because the amount that the federal government got from individual income taxes increased, it's just not accurate to say that the tax cuts led to some huge decrease in federal government revenue. How is that freaking connected? Just because we gained more in income taxes does not mean we got more money overall like those aren't connected at all we lost money overall that is the point we are trying to make like jeez what do you guys think yeah she's just obfuscating like oh well i mean 
if we just decrease like corporate taxes and specific um, areas of the tax code for the wealthy, but uh, personal, like personal individual income taxes increase, then then that's basically a wash. Like that's what she's trying to say. But obviously, like we know that's not the case. Because we got more income taxes from individuals, that means we got more money over. Like it just doesn't make sense. Okay, let's see what she has to say. And I want. And this is hilarious. She brings up the Laffer curve, and you'll see how stupid this is once I explain why this is idiotic. It didn't happen. And I know some of you now might be wondering, well, how is it possible that taxes were cut, but the amount that the government taxes didn't decrease? And, well, that's due to something called the Laffer curve. Again, according to Investopedia, the Laffer curve describes the relationship between tax rates and total tax revenue with an optimal tax rate that maximizes total government tax revenue. If taxes are too high along the Laffer curve, then they will discourage the taxed activities such as work and investment enough to actually reduce total tax revenue. In this case, cutting tax rates will both stimulate economic incentives and increase tax revenue. Which it only did of uh, individual income taxes. It didn't increase uh, corporation income taxes. So it doesn't look like it really worked too well because it only like got half of the like equation, right? It got more individual income taxes, but we lost a lot in corporation taxes. And I even have her uh, article here, her uh, from Investopedia, which goes into like X, like a, uh, goes into detail about how this is such a stupidly simple theory which is so stupid like four large paragraphs about it how this is just so simplistic and ignorant such an ignorant way of viewing taxes and why we get more when we decrease taxes and stuff you know yeah it, like like the best way i can describe the laughter curve is like if i were a nutritionist and i told a patient like hey if you eat absolutely nothing, you'll starve to death. But if you eat too much, you'll die of a heart attack. So you're going to want to be somewhere in the middle between starving and uh, eating, like, you know, yourself to death. So, you know, good luck. Yeah. Good. That's basically all the Laffer Curve tells you. <laughs> Pretty much. Let's continue. Let me see your dick for a little bit. Once more, the theory behind the Laffer curve is a very simple one. If taxes are too high, then it is going to make it difficult for businesses and individuals to conduct commerce. If taxes are too high, then businesses have less money available to invest in their businesses. And if taxes are too high, then individuals will have less disposable income to maybe set aside and then one day invest in starting their own business. Why, why do these people, why do conservatives always talk about, oh, people want to start their own businesses? Like, dude, not everybody wants to own a business. <laughs> Mm. Like, what the fuck is their obsession with this shit? <sighs> the American dream. Yeah, the American dream. Start a small business which will fall into the ground because you don't make enough money. Uh, exploit <laughs> the labor of poor people. The American dream, you know? <laughs> Fucking you. So there will be for the government to tax even though they're operating at these really high tax rates and conversely if taxes are lower then people and businesses will have more income disposable to invest in things like new businesses and therefore increase their income and so give the government more money even though it's a lower percentage of that's not what happens though we have uh let me see i'm not sure if i have the let's see um i had a source earlier give me one second you guys uh, talk about that for a second i guess if you want You guys still there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't translate to that. Like, uh, empirical evidence shows they it just doesn't work. They don't put their money to starting new jobs. They just put it to other things that benefit them, but not us, you know? Yeah. I have this article from The Balance, which goes over it, in theory, in a, a little bit of detail. Okay, let's uh, finish this off of tax. That made sense in my head it did, but I will see how this video turns out. And lastly, another complaint that I so often hear from those who talk about trickle-down economics and heck, Biden even mentioned it himself in his speech, is the issue of income inequality. I mean, right here we have a piece from The Hill saying how Trump fueled economic inequality in America. I've referenced this in many videos before, but wealth inequality is a 
pretty poor metric to measure success, if you ask me. The left really does think of the economy as a zero-sum game, where if the rich are getting richer, that must mean that the poor are getting poorer. And if you're actually a communist or socialist, then there also is the implicit understanding that, oh, the rich are only getting richer because they're actively stealing wealth from the working class. None of this is true, and honestly- I mean, they kind of are with the low wages and stuff. You're not giving them the wages that they deserve for their labor. So they're kind of stealing money in that kind of sense, you know? And also, to talk about uh, the economy in such a zero-sum game, um, let me see here. Um, the economy is not really doing that good either way. We have, a char we have like six charts here showing how it really didn't do much better overall under Trump compared to like the past. And how Ob the economy got better in some aspects just because of Obama's uh, policies and shit. Like... Freaking, it's not a zero-sum game. Income equality is not, inequality is not, like, the only way to look at the economy. But we do look at the economy other ways, and the economy isn't really doing that good. It's not booming like Trump claims. It's just doing mediocre. And some of the good things that it has is because of Obama's uh, policies and shit. Like, you just, the only people who listen to this shit are people who just listen to this and don't do their own research they just absorb it and don't do anything else and just repeat it like indoctrinated brainwashed little sheep you know definitely yeah let's finish this off so if you've taken a single economics class you will know how garbage all of that is it is totally possible for the Wait a second a single economics class you mean in the liberal uh colleges that are filled with marxist indoctrination <laughs> <laughs> She's complained about that shit in the past, by the way, about the Marxist indoctrination in colleges. Like, now you're citing the college classes that you you bashed in the past. Like, yeah, that is that's pretty curious. Yes, yeah, looking no, pretty man. sus there, Lauren. No, hold up. She's uh, she's shilling for the Prager U economics. Class. Oh, oh, she's, she's shilling for Prager U. <laughs> she's shilling for the University of Prager. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> rich to get rich but also for the poor and middle class to get richer as well. I mean, during Biden's speech, he did specifically mention all of these billionaires who are part of companies like Amazon who did get richer while the rest of the country got poorer. But I'll say it again, that is not supply side or trickle down economics. That is the result of harsh government regulations that favored a select few companies because they probably have government connections. That is not capitalism. Under just a regular free market economy, it is possible for someone like Jeff Bezos to get filthy, stinking rich while also providing a lot of jobs for hundreds of thousands of people i find the reason yeah shit jobs <laughs> just because someone has a job doesn't mean it's a good job that will pay the bills and pay for health insurance and food like seriously you have a job that's all that matters it doesn't matter how good the job is how much it pays what kind of benefits it provides you have a job suck it up it's basically what she's saying huh. yeah Okay, let's try to finish this. The reason why wealth and is such a popular talking point among socialists and the far left is because so much of their ideology operates based off of greed and just- Socialists and the far left? Dude, this is like the rest of the developed country says the exact same shit this so-called far left is saying. Like, is the rest of the world filled with communists and socialists now? Like, jeez wanting we don't have but wealth inequality it's not an objective measure of how a society is doing and if you don't believe me let's just take a minute to look at some of the countries with the best and worst wealth inequality in the world some of the most equitable countries in terms of wealth include the ukraine but also norway and conversely some of the countries with the highest wealth inequality include sweden the united states and thailand so okay but sweden has a social safety net and government benefits which help the poor if they end up getting screwed over somehow like you know that's so yeah. they have help if they get screwed over even with the wealth income with the income inequality shit they yeah. have help americans do not at most we have like medicaid but that's for the extreme poor people like not very many people qualify for it let's try to finish this up quickly so i can Upload this ASAP.
But you've really got a spread of different economic situations there. And that's why, I mean, I know it's a popular talking point right now, but wealth inequality really doesn't tell you much about an economy. So even if supply side economics does increase wealth inequality, I still think it's a favorable policy position because it decreases overall poverty, which I think is a much better indicator of how your country is doing. That's what does it? I don't. She doesn't provide a study for that or anything. That's kind of a baseless claim there, you know? Love how she squeezes that in at the last second with no evidence whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if she says anything extra. It's pretty much all I have to say for now. And as always, I would love to hear what you all think. Did you watch Biden's speech? And if you did, what did you think about it? The media is saying that 85% of the people who watched it liked it. I have my doubts about that, but... I mean, he's a pretty popular president so far, I believe. He's got a pretty high approval rating among young people, I believe. Probably because he's kind of moving a little bit progressive in terms of some of his rhetoric and I think a few of his policies. What do you guys think? Yeah, contrary to the burning of buses, like Biden has been uh, pretty left uh, on specifically like welfare state policies. Um, we a little disappointing he didn't go for the $15 minimum wage, but maybe he'll do that um later down the line. He said he would push future budget. He said he would push yeah. for a $15 minimum wage during his uh union address, I believe, which got me a little bit poggers. Uh what do you guys think of the video overall? Uh uh just deceptive. Yeah, it's just like pushing propaganda to people that like want to just like agree with everything she says it seems do you think she's like a good faith actor do you think she's just genuinely this stupid or do you think she's actually like dece being super deceptive in not uh not meaning any of the shit she says at all knowing she's wrong but just trying to get views what do you guys think that's hard to like make that call i'll just i'm not like too familiar with her but i would i would lean more to like being deceptive I mean, she is the same person who, like, basically heavily implied, like, uh, brown people are, like, super stupid, and that's why she's for, like, super hard, uh, uh, border regulations, and she cites how, like, the Muslims are invading Europe and shit. She's, like, basically a white nationalist, but really denies it because she never outright says it's brown people that are the problem, but she heavily implies it by saying, Oh, these poor immigrants from poor countries with such low intellect are destroying these countries type of shit. Basically, white nationalists uh, uh, talking points. I'm going to have to disagree with j -Rick. I think it's like she's just that badly misinformed and is just like repeating a bunch of like talking points that she's heard before. Like she said, like on a few occasions, like economics isn't a zero sum game, which like it's just like an abstract quote that you could like hear from. Uh, practically anywhere um i only say that because um white nationalists these days are typically like uh nozbles they're like really really hard left when it comes to like economics and when i say hard left they mean i mean mostly like um authoritarian state intervention into the economy she's just like repeating the ayn rand like randian talking points so yeah. it's like she probably just like, googled what is supply side economics? And oh, if the lefties hate supply side economics, then that must mean it's a good thing. The lefties well, hate Paul, it's probably a Paul, that. So basically, because yeah. she's a woman, like she's just uninformed and dumb, dude. That's a kind pretty of woman. Yikes, a pretty woman. <laughs> I've she's seen. Hot. It's funny. I've seen a whole subreddit just dedicated to wank, wanking it, rubbing one out to her. It's so weird. It's not that weird. She's like a hot woman, like. Do Fascist that kind of Barbie shit. is what people call her. <laughs> I mean, she's she's like uh she's like Asian Lauren Southern. It's funny, they share the same name, by the way. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, I guess that's really it. That went on for about forty four minutes. So, hope you guys nice. had fun. Hell yeah. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna end the video here. I don't know what to do for an outro, so. One second. Let me get, let me, uh, let me get, get you it. later, Pog Stoners. Yeah, catch you later, Pog Stoners. And I'm gonna yeah, upload this video to the See y'all later. See y'all on the flip side. Flip side, yeah.